This morning we will begin what I hope will be a series on frequently asked questions about the Church of Christ, our friends and our neighbors and co-workers and those that we begin to talk about the gospel with. Uh, well, often there's, there's some common questions that you're going to hear when you start to talk about uh, the gospel and the church that belongs to Jesus. And over the next few weeks, we'll, we'll try to cover some of those topics if the Lord wills. Uh, and hopefully we will be able, as Peter instructs us in 1 Peter chapter 3 and verse 15, to give a, an answer to anyone who asks a reason for the hope that's in us with meekness and fear. And this morning's question that we'll discuss is sometimes, and, and we'll see this as we go through some of these, that the questions are sometimes more an accusation than they are a question. Uh, and and that's somewhat the case with this question. You'll hear, well, isn't the Church of Christ a denomination? Isn't it just a denomination like all the other denominations that are out there, such as the Catholics or the Presbyterians or the Seventh-day Adventists or the Mormons or the, the Jehovah's Witnesses or the um, Lutherans or the Methodists or the Baptists? And you can just keep going and going and, and, and going because there is so much division among those who claim to follow Jesus. Isn't the Church of Christ a denomination? Well, before we answer the question, we need to understand what exactly is a denomination. And what is a denomination? If you just Google the word, this is the definition that's going to pop up. It's a noun. It's a recognized, autonomous branch of the Christian church. That's the way the world sees this idea of denominationalism, that uh, each group is just, uh, they're, they're equal with every other group. They're, they're all uh, followers of Jesus, and yet they may be uh, on a, a slightly different path. That uh, we're all headed to the same place, we're just using a different way to get there. And so uh, the fact that these groups all claim to follow Jesus and yet have contradictory doctrines. Uh, for instance, uh, this morning here you will hear it taught that baptism is necessary for salvation. <coughs> But if you were up here in town and you were at the first, big First Baptist Church on the highway, what you would hear is that baptism is not necessary for salvation. And yet we both claim to be following Jesus. So uh, when, under the denominational economy, that idea is okay. It's okay that we have these contradictory doctrines because, as I said, we're all following Jesus. We're just on different paths. And so you've got a bunch of branches of what is the Christian church. That's the denominational idea. And we, I have a couple of illustrations that I pulled off of a couple of different websites, and I, I hope you can see that. I may have cluttered that up just a bit there. Uh, the first one is from the, it's called Baptist Board. It's a message board for Baptists where they go and they discuss various topics. Uh, and one of the threads that was on this message board was, is a Church of Christ member saved? In other words, can someone be a member of the Church of Christ and still be uh, in a right relationship with God? Uh, and I've got it highlighted there. Uh, it says, the person begins, I know there are Christians in all denominations. I know there are Christians in all denominations. So you've got all of these various bodies that claim to follow Jesus. I know there are Christians in all these different branches of the Christian church, autonomous branches. And that is the denominational idea, that there are, they're all Christians, they're just all in these different bodies, autonomous bodies, branches of the Christian church. And the second uh, example there is from uh, the U United Methodist Church's um, website, umc.org. And again, if you get online and you look at the, uh, look at this PowerPoint whenever you if you get on our website, I'll have it up probably at least by Tuesday, Lord willing. Uh, I've got the URLs there where you can go and look at these things. I'm not, this is not something that I've made up. You can actually go and, and look at the examples that I'm presenting here. Uh, and the question is, on that website, how do I become a member of the United Methodist Church? And it begins the answer with, if you are a member of another part of the church, such as Baptist, Presbyterian, or Lutheran, then you can transfer your membership from that church to a local United Methodist Church. So there is the idea again. Branches, autonomous branches of the Christian 
church. Is this a valid way to look at things? Can we go to the Bible and, and justify this view of Christianity? I would say that we cannot. The scriptures don't teach that. Denominationalism, that idea, division, and that's what to denominate means is to divide. Uh, you've got, when you look at a fraction, I know you were told there would be no math, <laughs> but just for a moment here, if, if you've got the numerator on top and you've got the denominator on the bottom. And what does that mean? You divide. That's what the denominator does. That's what denominationalism means. It means division. And it is condemned in the scriptures. Christians are to be united. If you turn with me to 1 Corinthians chapter 1 and beginning in verse 10, the apostle Paul there uh, talks about some problems that he's heard that exist in the Corinthian church. In verse 10 he says, Now I plead with you, brethren, by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that you all speak the same thing, and that there be no divisions among you, but that you be perfectly joined together in the same mind and in the same judgment. For it has been declared to me concerning you, my brethren, by those of Chloe's household, that there are contentions among you. Now I say this, that each of you says, I am of Paul, or I am of Apollos, or I am of Cephas, or I am of Christ. Is Christ divided? Was Paul crucified for you? Or were you baptized in the name of Paul? Paul says here in verse 10 that we are to have no divisions, that we are to speak the same thing and to be of the same mind and the same judgment. And so I ask, when we meet here and we say that baptism is necessary for salvation, and the Baptists in their building up on the highway say that baptism is not necessary for salvation, are we speaking the same thing? Are we of the same mind and are we of the same judgment? Is there division? I bet there's enough room for us up there in their building. I bet we could fit in there this morning if we decided to go up there. But we don't because there is division. Denominationalism says that's okay, that variety is the spice of life. The Bible says something different. Paul says, let there be no divisions among you. Be of the same mind, the same judgment, speak the same things. In Philippians 3 and verse 16, Paul says, nevertheless, to the degree that we have already attained, let us walk by the same rule. Let us be of the same mind. We're to walk by the same rule and be of the same mind. Paul says it this way in Ephesians chapter 4. Turn with me to Ephesians, the fourth chapter. We'll begin reading in verse 1. Ephesians chapter 4, beginning in verse 1. Paul says, I therefore, the prisoner of the Lord, beseech you to walk worthy of the calling with which you were called. You remember the first three chapters here, Paul has talked about God's glorious plan to redeem man in Christ Jesus. And he gets to chapter 4 and he begins to tell us, okay, based upon this, this is how you need to live your life. And he says there, we are to walk worthy of the calling with which we are called. He says in verse 2, with all lowliness and gentleness, with long suffering, bearing with one another in love, endeavoring to keep the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. We are to endeavor to keep the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. If we're going to walk worthy of the calling with which we are called, that's what we're going to strive for. The unity of the Spirit. And I would contend that that is not some mystical thing that we're working toward. The Spirit has revealed to us the mind of Christ, 1 Corinthians chapter 2 and verse 16. And the unity of the Spirit comes when we read and study the mind of Christ, found in the pages of the New Testament. And we strive to be united in that. When we have the doctrine of Christ, as 2 John verse 9 talks about, and we don't go beyond it, we don't transgress it. We're condemned if we do, 2 John verse 9 says. We strive for the unity of the Spirit and we're going to walk worthy of the calling with which we're called. Christians are to be united. Division violates the prayer of our Lord. Jesus in the night in which he was betrayed in John chapter 17 and beginning in verse 20 prays a prayer there for us today. We are those who believe in him through the word of of the apostles. And this prayer is specifically for us. Verse 20, John chapter 17. Jesus says, I do not pray for these alone, speaking of the apostles there, but also for those who will believe in me through their word, that they all may be one, as you, Father, are in me and I in you, 
that they also may be one in us, that the world may believe that you sent me. And the glory which you have given me, I have given them, that they may be one just as we are one. I and them, and you and me, that they may be made perfect in one, and that the world may know that you have sent me and have loved them as you have loved me. The level of oneness that we are to have is to be similar or like that of the Father and the Son. As much as they are one, we are to be one. It doesn't exist today in the, under the denominational concept. It violates the Lord's Prayer. Division is carnal, and it makes us enemies of God. 1 Corinthians chapter 3. Go back to the context where we began there in 1 Corinthians. Paul is still dealing with that, that topic of division. He says, there's, there's division among you. It shouldn't be that way because of the gospel. All we're doing is preaching the gospel. The gospel, the words that the Holy Spirit revealed, chapter 2 and verse 13. We're supposed to be one in that. Chapter 3 and verse 1, he says, And I, brethren, could not speak to you as to spiritual people, but as to carnal. As to babes in Christ, I fed you with milk and not with solid food, for until now you were not able to receive it, and even now you are still not able, for you are still carnal. For where there are envy, strife, and divisions among you, are you not carnal and behaving like mere men? For when one says, I am of Paul, and another, I am of Apollos, are you not carnal? Division is carnality. Romans chapter 8 tells us how dangerous that is. Romans, the 8th chapter, Beginning in verse 6, Paul says, For to be carnally minded is death, but to be spiritually minded is life and peace, because the carnal mind is enmity against God, for it is not subject to the law of God, nor indeed can be. So then those who are in the flesh cannot please God. This carnal mind is enmity with God. This carnal mind is one that is not subject to the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus. So we become an enemy of God when we advocate for division among those who are his people. The fact of the matter is, is that Jesus has but one church. Jesus has one church. Matthew chapter 16 and verse 18, Jesus promised to build his church singular. He said, I now also say to you, speaking to Peter, that you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of Hades shall not prevail against it. That rock being the confession that Peter has just made, that you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. He said, I will build my church, and that church is his body, and there is only the one. Turn with me back to Ephesians, the fourth chapter. We read verses 1 through 3 that talk about the unity of the Spirit and the bond of peace and how we are to endeavor to keep that if we're to walk worthy of the calling of which we're called. Ephesians chapter 4, beginning in verse 4, Paul continues the thought there. Ephesians chapter 4, beginning in verse 4, he says, There is one body and one spirit, just as you were called in one hope of your calling, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all who is above all and through all and in you all. There is one body. Just as there is one God, one Lord, one Spirit, one body. That body is the church back in Ephesians chapter 1, just across the page in my Bible. Ephesians chapter 1 verse 22, Paul says, speaking of Jesus, he put, God put all things under his feet, under the feet of Jesus, and gave him to be head over all things to the church which is his body, the fullness of him who fills all in all. There is one body, and that body is the church, and so there is but one church. And that one church has the unity of the Spirit and the bond of peace. There is to be unity in that church. That church is recognizable. We can recognize that church because it wears the right name. We can go to the pages of the New Testament we can see that church. There's no name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved other than the name of Jesus. It's the church that belongs to Him. It doesn't belong to 
a particular religious practice, such as baptism. It doesn't belong to Martin Luther. It is not the Presbyterian Church. Is that John Calvin's thing? It's the church that belongs to Jesus, and it holds the right doctrine. Jesus said in John chapter 8 and verse 31, If you abide in my word, then you are my disciples indeed. We are to abide in the word of Jesus. And we are not to go beyond what that word allows, what that word authorizes. 2 John verse 9, whoever transgresses and does not abide in the doctrine of Christ does not have God. He who abides in the doctrine of Christ has both the Father and the Son. So that church holds to that doctrine, the doctrine of Christ, his teaching. That's what it means to be a Christian. Acts chapter 11 and verse 26, the disciples were first called Christians in Antioch. Disciples are those who abide in his word, John 8, 31. So the church that belongs to Jesus is the church that holds the right doctrine. That church is organized scripturally. You can go to the pages of the New Testament. You can read about this church's organization. Jesus is the head, Colossians chapter 1 and verse 18. And in Acts chapter 14 and verse 23, we're told that they appointed elders in every church. So you've got Jesus as the head, and then you've got elders in every church shepherding the flock which is among them, 1 Peter chapter 5 and verse 2. And then you've got deacons serving under those elders, Acts chapter 6 and verses 1 through 7. You read about that. 1 Timothy chapter 3, you can read the qualifications for both elders and deacons. And then you've got all the members of the Lord's church that are a holy priesthood offering up spiritual sacrifices, 1 Peter chapter 2 and verse 5. That's the scriptural organization. That's the church that belongs to Jesus. It's recognizable. The church that Jesus built does scriptural work because the scriptures are the mind of Christ. And the church that belongs to Jesus does those things that they are to do based upon the authority that Jesus has given. Whatever you do in word or deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him, Colossians chapter 3, verse 17. So that church will do what the word of God authorizes. That church worships in spirit and in truth. John chapter 4 and verse 24, God desires such to worship him. Those who will worship in spirit and in truth. Truth is the word of God, John chapter 17 and verse 17. That church has the right terms of entrance. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven, but he who does the will of my Father in heaven is what Jesus said in Matthew chapter 7 and verse 21. The church that belongs to Jesus will have the right terms of entrance. He that believes and is baptized shall be saved, Mark chapter 16 and verse 16. And the Lord added to the church daily such as should be saved, Acts 2 and verse 47. And those in Acts chapter 2 who were being added to the church were those who gladly received the word and were baptized, Acts chapter 2 and verse 41. That church that belongs to Jesus is founded at the right time and in the right place. Jesus said in Mark chapter 9 and verse 1, that there were some standing there who would not taste death until they saw the kingdom of God present with power. That power came in Acts the second chapter, the day of Pentecost, after the death and the resurrection of Jesus. Isaiah chapter 2 and verses 2 and 3 prophesies about the, the establishment of the Lord's kingdom, his church. Turn with me, Isaiah chapter 2. Verse 2 says, Now it shall come to pass in the latter days that the mountain of the Lord's house shall be established on top of the mountains and shall be exalted above the hills, and all nations shall flow to it. Many people shall come and say, Come and let us go up to the mountain of the Lord, to the house of God of Jacob. He will teach us his ways, and we shall walk in his paths. For out of Zion shall go forth the law and the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. And so the Lord's church is to be established. His rule, his dominion is to be established in Jerusalem, is where it was to begin. And that's what the prophecy tells us. And it was to happen within the lifetime of some of, the, some of those who heard Jesus speaking. So that's the Lord's church. So if the church that you are a member of wasn't established until the 1600s like the Baptist church, or until the 1800s like the Mormon church, or until the 600s, the Catholic church, it's, as it, uh, in its present form, or very close there to with the, the first pope being named in the 600s. Or the 1800s for the Seventh-day Adventists. Or the 1600s for the Presbyterians. Or the 1700s for the Methodists. 
If your church was begin, began at some other time other than in uh, the, the days shortly following the death and resurrection of Jesus, and if it began anywhere other than Jerusalem, it is not the Lord's church. It's recognized, but we can see it there. The Lord's church is recognized. We'll notice also that it is unnecessary to be a member of a denomination in order to be saved. You don't have to be a member of any denomination in order to go to heaven. And this is from a website, baptistdistinctives.org. And it says, the first box there, when a person who has never been a member of any church requests membership in a Baptist church, he or she is asked to give evidence of having trusted in Jesus Christ as personal Lord and Savior. Furthermore, Baptist churches require that a person experience believer's baptism before becoming a member. Therefore, a person seeking membership is asked both to make a profession of faith in Christ and to be baptized. And so, in order to be a member of the Baptist church, you have to be baptized. Believer's baptism. They're talking about water baptism here. You've got to be baptized to be a member of the Baptist church. But notice this next box there. And this is talking about accepting the baptisms from other groups to be able to get into the Baptist church. It says, generally speaking, if such a person has not been baptized by immersion as a believer in Christ, a Baptist church will require that he or she indicate faith in Christ and be baptized before becoming a member. If the person has been immersed as a believer, but that baptism was considered necessary for salvation, most Baptist churches will require the person to be baptized before becoming a member. This is done in order to make clear that baptism, while important, is not necessary for salvation. And so what do we see here? Water baptism is not necessary for salvation. Water <laughs> baptism is necessary to be a member of the Baptist church. And so I can be saved without being water baptized, which means I can be saved without being a member of the Baptist church that I can't be a member of unless I'm baptized. Do you see that argument? There's no point in being a member of a Baptist church. It doesn't save you. You're saved prior to becoming a member of a Baptist church. That's the point that they make in their own material. The same thing is true for the Methodist church. And I'm not trying to pick on Baptists and Methodists this morning. These are just the easiest examples that I was able to come up with in preparation for this sermon. The Methodist church. How do I? And this is from umc.org. How do I become a member of a, Method, a United Methodist Church? It says, if you have never been baptized, you will prepare for baptism. You must be baptized in order to be a member of the Methodist Church. But you notice again, when it talks about baptism, do I have to be baptized in order to be saved? No. But baptism is a gift of God's grace. To be received as part of the journey of salvation, to refuse to accept baptism is to reject one of the means of grace that God appoints. Uh, offers us. So I've got to be baptized to be part of their denomination, but I don't have to be baptized to be saved, so I don't need to be a member of their denomination in order to be saved. You don't have to be a member of a denomination in order to be saved, and yet what do the scriptures teach about being a member of the Lord's church, the church that belongs to Jesus, the one that Jesus built? The Bible says we must be a member of that body. In order to be saved, Ephesians chapter 5 and verse 23, Paul says, For the husband is head of the wife, as also Christ is head of the church, and he is the Savior of the body. And what is the body? The body is the church. He's the Savior of that body. If you want to be saved, you have to be part of that body. The Lord added to the church daily those who were being saved, Acts chapter 2 and verse 47 tells us. And so to be saved, to go to heaven, you have to be a member of the church that Jesus built. The one that we can recognize when we go back to the pattern that's found in God's word, we can see what that church looked like. We can replicate that church. That's the restoration plea. Go back to the Bible. Speak as the oracles of God. Do what you find there because it's the mind of Christ and we can know that we're right. We can have the unity of the spirit in the bond of when we go back to God's word. And we can be saved because we can become a member of that body, the church that belongs to Jesus. But you'll often hear the accusation that, well, all right, but 
the group that you belong to, that's, you're a bunch of Campbellites. You ever hear that said? Some of you younger folks may not have ever heard that. But that's the charge that gets leveled against members of the Lord's Church. Well, you're Campbellites. Your church didn't exist until the 1800s, early 1800s, when Alexander Campbell established that body. And they use it in a, a derogatory, derisive sense. You're Campbellites, though we reject that name. Did Alexander Campbell found the Church of Christ? In the 1800s? Is the church buildings with Church of Christ on the, uh, on the sign? Are they part of a body that Alexander Campbell established? Well, did he come up with that name, Church of Christ? Did Alexander Campbell, did that originate with him? It did not. Romans 16 and verse 16, the churches of Christ salute you. That's a scriptural name. There are other scriptural names that we can use, the Church of God, the household of faith, the house of God. There are any any number of scriptural terms we could, we could put on the sign. But why would we reject the name of Christ? Why would we have to discount it? Because men have, have ruined the idea that there's a church that belongs to Jesus. Church of Christ on our side out here does not mean uh, anything of a denominational sort. It states the ownership. Church of Christ means church that belongs to Jesus. It's a scriptural name. Alexander Campbell didn't come up with that. Did he determine the terms of entrance? No, he did not. Jesus said, He that believes in his baptized shall be saved in Mark 16 and 16. And God adds to the church daily such as should be saved, Acts 2 and verse 47. Alexander Campbell didn't come up with that. Did he define the word of the church that belongs to Jesus, the church of Christ? No. God prepared works beforehand that we should walk in them, Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 10 tells us. We are thoroughly equipped for every good work by the scriptures, 2 Timothy chapter 3 and verse 17 tells us. God prepared the work of the church, and when we do all things by the authority of Jesus, we're doing those works which God authorizes. Colossians 3, 17. Did Alexander Campbell design the worship of the church? He did not. The things that we do here this morning, these are things that we find in the scriptures. The example, we, we turn there and we find that they, they gathered in the first century when the church was established. And they prayed to God. And they taught the word. And they partook of the Lord's Supper. And they sang hymns and they gave their means. Those five things, they did those. We can go back to the pages of God's word and we can see that they did it. Alexander Campbell didn't come up with that. Did he develop the organization? We've already talked about the organization. He did not. The scriptures established the organization for the church that Jesus built. Alexander Campbell didn't come up with the idea that Jesus is the head of the church, that there are elders in every church, and that they shepherd the flock that is among them, and that the, the members there are being built up of a royal priesthood. Which doctrine that the church of Christ, and I speak for this one because as we noted in class, you cannot necessarily uh, assume that just because there's a sign on the building that says Church of Christ, that that church is going to be following the pattern that's laid out in the New Testament. And we talked about some of those differences in class. But as for this church, which doctrine that we teach, which one originated with Alexander Campbell? <laughs> we are abiding in the Word of Christ. We are disciples of Christ. We are Christians. We do only those things that are authorized by the Word of God. Which one of those originated with Alexander Campbell? And so, speaking for this church, because I know what's going on here, we are not a denomination. We are a congregation of the Lord's people meeting in Alvarado, Texas, wearing the proper name, the proper organization, engaging in the proper worship, engaging in the proper work, <coughs> following the right doctrine, the right terms of entrance. And so I can say that this is a body, part of the body of Christ. The church of Christ. The church that belongs to Jesus. And I encourage you today, if you've never obeyed the gospel of Jesus Christ, be added to the Lord's church. 
God will add you when you're obedient to the gospel. Believe that Jesus is the Christ. Confess him before men. Repent of your sins and be baptized and have your sins washed away. And when you do that, the Lord will add you to his church. You'll have the hope of heaven. If you're here this morning and you're already a child of God and your life has not been in keeping with the will of God, you must repent. And we'll pray with you and for you. God will forgive you. Whatever your need might be, why don't you come forward and make it known? While together we stand and sing.